Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm really excited for our conversation today. I have with me uh, the legendary Kunal, Kunal Behel, who's I think uh, familiar to all of us uh, and uh, has been a critical integral part of the Indian tech ecosystem story over the last decade. And my own uh, uh, association with Kunal goes back uh, over a decade or so back to our alma mater uh, uh, Wharton. And uh, so I'm extremely, extremely delighted, Kunal, uh, to be speaking with you today. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Anirudh. It's a, it's a pleasure being here and being amongst uh, old friends. So over the last couple of years, I, as many of us have seen, the Indian startup ecosystem has taken a step jump up. Of course, over the last decade, decade and a half, we've seen many large innovative companies including, for example, Kunal, uh, the company you started, Snapdeal, grow leaps and bounds as the Indian mobile ecosystem has flourished as well, the smartphone ecosystem. But now there's a tangible feeling that India might be at yet another inflection point where we could now jump up from focusing only on, let's say, largely India-focused companies, marketplaces, mobility companies, so on and so forth, to now becoming a key player in the global game. And that's something I describe in my own book, The Great Tech Game, where I argue that we are really now living through a new era. We can all obviously agree that there have been recent economic gains in the last two centuries that India might have missed on. The industrialization game being, I would say, probably the best example, where we are still lagging behind some of the countries that industrialized early and industrialized fast. And if today that is correct, if today we are living in a new era, a new tech era, or the great tech game, as I call it. The question is, what can India do to make sure that this time around we are not lagging behind? Instead, we are leading and we are at the forefront of the global tech community. And that's really the question we will be uh, focused on today and unwrapping a little bit uh, in the course of our conversation. So Kunal, with that context, I would love for you to uh, start off and tell us a little bit about the decade or I guess maybe now actually over a decade long journey that you've had in the Indian tech ecosystem and how you feel the tech ecosystem has evolved. What have we gotten right over the last decade? Yeah, Anirudh, um, I think a great context there and, and highly recommend uh, Anirudh's uh, book. It's um, it's quite a, quite a fantastic read and probably couldn't have come at a better timing because we definitely are at an inflection point. You know, 13 years ago, when, when I started, 13, 14 years ago, startups were, weren't even a positive word. I mean, they were, they were actually uh, almost something that, you know, if you were starting a company, even if you came from a good education background, people thought that you're doing it because of adverse selection, that somehow you didn't get a good job at a Google or a Microsoft or a McKinsey, and that's why you're starting a company. Obviously, we've come a long way uh, over the last decade, and India's caught up so tremendously across so many different dimensions where our internet user base is materially larger than the internet user bases of any other country on the planet outside of China. So suddenly there's been a great equalization that seems to happen, not on income, but definitely on, on internet penetration. Now, I think the, the other thing that I've seen, which has materially changed over the last uh, decade or so, is just the local, uh, the domestic investment ecosystem. In um, you know about 10, 12 years ago, there were maybe 10 VCs in India um, of all shapes, sizes, vintage, etc. Most of the VCs were running their first fund. Now, you know, a decade and a half later, there are so many venture capital firms, so many domestic venture capital firms, international venture capital firms, family offices, micro VCs, angel investors, we have one of the most vibrant uh, domestic or early stage investment ecosystem on the planet at this point in time. Now, um, in addition, yeah. I feel the, 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 the other important thing that has happened is that every segment, as, as we have seen this explosion of the you know, connected user base of India go from few million people to a billion people over the last decade and a half, thanks to the 4G revolution three, four years ago, so many different segments have lit up uh, online. 
uh, India, as everyone always says, is a land of tremendous heterogeneity and diversity of diversity of opportunities. However, the, this, this heterogeneity and diversity of opportunities didn't exist online till uh, in the digital world till about five years ago, because most of the audience that was online was fairly homogeneous. They were affluent metro dwellers uh, who had credit cards, um, well-traveled, well-read. Now, we went in the last four years, it's uh, four or five years, we've gone from somewhere around 150, 200 million, million internet users to a billion internet users. And suddenly the same heterogeneity that exists in, in the offline world in India, in the real world in India, is now manifesting itself in the digital world. And that is opening a plethora of new opportunities in the world of software, in, in B2C businesses, brands, um, and various types of interesting innovations that have come up to cater to these diverse seg uh, the diverse needs of these diverse segments of consumers in our country. So it's actually a really exciting time uh, to be in India, to be building in India, uh, for India and for the world. So you've touched upon the capital piece and given I've also been on the VC side of things for a while, let me ask you about the capital piece first, and then I'll move on to tech and talent. On the capital side, it's clear that there's sufficient capital available today if you have a great idea and a good team in place, right? Um, but the question really is, okay, how do we improve on this? One of the things I've heard a lot of people now say is that most of the venture capital dollars in India today are still foreign venture capital backed. So the question is, how do we unlock domestic capital more? Because for, even from my vantage point, I think that while there are more Indian domestic angel investors that have come in, there are some homegrown venture capital funds also that have come in. But I would say probably if I was to guess, I don't have the exact number, but probably at least 75 to 80 percent of the venture capital money is still foreign, which means that the returns to that capital when companies like yours succeed does accrue back <clears throat> to the holders of that capital, which are foreign. So not to make this a nationalistic conversation, but to ask you, okay, how do how can domestic investors also benefit from this innovation that is currently underway in India and not just you know participate from the outside? So what, what in your view are ways in which we can unlock domestic capital more? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Arirudh, and I feel this question was even more relevant, let's say, about two years ago where the domestic participation was quite low. There was a lot of skepticism. The last two years and the digital acceleration due to COVID has suddenly transformed the mindset of the domestic investor. And while there's been this big bull run in the stock market, I can tell you that the extent of domestic capital that is getting unlocked as we speak going into startups is um, something that we haven't seen before. And sometimes when we're very very close to the facts, we don't see it enough. But when we zoom out, I can tell you that 2020, 21, 22 and onwards is going to be the, the inflection point of domestic participation in startups driven by a few things. Uh, firstly, you know, I think all the domestic investors are seeing that these companies that are getting created, mostly funded by global venture capital firms uh, are real. They are enduring, lasting businesses that are here to stay for a long period of time. I think that has been now proven with many companies going public and, and being successful post being public as well, uh, either in India or the US. The second thing is that uh, they've realized that there is actually a, a real game that comes at, at the end of it, right? Which is like, if you put in a hundred rupees, you got 200 rupees out in the end. It wasn't just a paper gain and you got happy just by seeing markups on paper. So I think there's been real gains that have been accrued by both uh, global as well as domestic institutional and individual investors. The third is the ecosystem of the AngelList, Let's Venture and similar syndicate uh, uh, platforms that, that have encouraged participation of, of uh, investors who want to put 1 lakh rupees or 5 lakh rupees or 20 lakh rupees. Those forums never existed because if you had to invest in a you know, AIF fund, you had to bring at least one crore or two crores or five crore minimums, which obviously then considerably limits the audience that can that can participate. And finally, we are seeing that uh, employees of 
startups who are getting liquidity they want to deploy all their liquidity back into the ecosystem they are not they are not getting a cash out of their esops and then saying let me go invest in public market stocks or a bank buy shares in a leading bank listed on uh, on a stock exchange they are investing a 100% a 100% of their gains back into the startups of their friends or their startups of their friends friend or their cousin etc we are just seeing such a groundswell as we speak of domestic uh, capital participation in the startup ecosystem also it has been aided by uh, as you would know recently the government um, you know reduced the taxation uh, for long term capital gains of um, of domestic investors uh, and 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 that ha- that is also very beneficial because one of the main reasons why a lot of people said that they don't want to participate in these uh, unlisted companies is because the taxation was very high even the long term capital gains that has gone down so that should further encourage many uh, many domestic investors to come in so there are plethora of factors at play and i feel the this ship has sailed now uh, the domestic capital participation in indian startup ecosystem it is just going to go from strength to strength uh, and anyone who is not partaking in this would probably somewhere down the road feel that this was the moment they needed to insert themselves in the in the ecosystem no that's right that's right no i completely agree i think that there is a there is a significant change i think that is now underway and i hope that as we go during these now the next decade now i hope that domestic capital as a portion of overall capital also goes up uh, let's now move to maybe the talent piece and i think if anyone follows you on twitter also i think there the elements of this you've touched upon but uh, let me ask you this so there's a very strong sense that india from a tech talent perspective is one of the strongest nations globally right we have both the tech managerial talent um, you i mean you know examples of satya nadella sundar pichai etc are very commonly thrown up at the highest levels but i would say even at the middle layer of global tech firms including obviously indian tech firms there's a lot of indian talent whether product managers so on and so forth and then of course the foundational layer of what i call the foundational layer of the talent which is your developers designers etc so i think india is strong at maybe all of these three layers yet yet i think the concern there or the risk there is that we risk losing a lot of this talent to foreign companies only right or at least some of the best talent uh one and second is if you talk to any startup now over the last year uh the biggest uh problem that most ceos or anyone really you talk to will talk to you about is talent right both the rising cost of talent and the difficulty of finding good engineering and tech talent so so tell me now if in that broader framework of what we're discussing which is what does india need to win where do we stand on talent from your perspective and how can we how can we improve on that sure yeah it's a it's a hot topic uh, no doubt see i, I have a provocative th- thought i think we for too long as a country we played this defense game of how do we prevent brain drain right i think there's so much conversation over the years not just now over the over the years has happened around how do we prevent brain uh, brain drain how do we prevent our best and brightest to go to san francisco or london or or wherever else um, how do we prevent that from happening i believe we got to change the the problem statement rather than continuously being in this um, you know defensive mode of how do we stop people from leaving our country i think we have to start going in a slightly more offense mode and saying how do we become a net importer of top talent right and because i feel that as a country what do we need we need the best talent now they may be indian they may not be indian right i think what do we care about as an ecosystem is that we have the best talent best engineering talent best product talent best talent for anything but particularly i think a lot of the narrative is around engineering and product talent these days and the dearth of it we want to be a net importer at some level for the longest time silicon valley um, became was the net importer at a global level of top talent why can't we be that right we are english speaking we offer great salary in your view i completely agree with you 
So what do we need to become like a Silicon Valley type attractor or a net importer of talent? Like what are the, let's say two, three things that we need to do as a country or as an ecosystem to make sure the next three to five years sees a lot of import of this talent coming in. Yeah, we need Whether Indian the, or sure. Yeah, we, we need some of the beachhead companies of our ecosystem to start to start taking a, uh, embodying that mindset that hey they want to become net importers of talent. See, oftentimes there are always a set of 10, 20, 30 companies that sort of shape the rest of the ecosystem that's taking a cue from them. That happens everywhere in the world. The Googles and the Facebooks and the Microsofts and the HPs. And the Cisco did that in the Valley. Uh, we have clearly some examples of companies here who are doing that, where people will look at them and say, what are they doing? Let me also try that at a smaller scale. So we need companies like we've started doing that. We've started looking for talent outside India now and encouraging them to move to India. You know, we offer great salaries. We offer a great lifestyle. Uh, there's low cost of living. We work with really smart uh, people. Um, everything is English speaking, like all the syntaxes are the same, uh, whether you're writing code in India or sitting anywhere else in the world. And most importantly, it brings an incredible amount of diversity of thought process within the company. Because otherwise, there can be a little bit of an echo chamber within a company because everyone comes from a similar culture, similar background, similar thought process, similar academic uh, you know, experiences, and similar exactly. professional experiences. So let's inject our ecosystem with talent that comes from outside, but while keeping a very high bar. And while we will not be able to stop everyone who intends to leave from leaving, my view is if we start thinking of ourselves as wanting to become a net importer of top talent in the world because of the plethora of opportunities we offer in India, because of the capital available to chase these plethora of opportunities in India, um, we will see that the retention of our own top talent will also increase uh, were that to happen. So I have a pretty, pretty strong view on uh, where we should be spending our energy rather than trying to hold back people, our, our best and brightest. No, completely think, agree. Yeah, we should enhance the uh, enhance the diversity of uh, diversity of perspectives in our ecosystem by injecting it with top talent from around the world. But let's move to maybe the uh, the third piece of this, uh, which is of the framework that I laid out, which is now tech, right? Uh, one of the earlier things I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation was how do we get Indian companies to build deep moats around themselves? And one of the established ways or one of the common ways in which companies like Google, Apple, uh, Cisco's of the world uh, have done that is to have core tech IP that they own, right? Or, or they own sometimes the operating system layer, or they own the search platform. And they build such deep modes around that, that they can continue to, you know, build large cash balances on their balance sheet, which then helps them fund further innovation. Right? So Indian companies are not necessarily in that position today, right? Most of the Indian companies that are the larger unicorns as well are still in fairly competitive marketplace type settings. Um, and, and the question then becomes to you, how do we move from this kind of tech ecosystem to a set of companies that are building deep tech driven or core tech driven modes around them? What are the things we need to do to catapult ourselves into that kind of ecosystem? Sure. So I, while I agree for the most part with what you said, Alrod, that, you know, core IP led businesses inherently have better modes, but actually, uh, you know, modes, but you think about it, right? Like the same exact thing that that company is building, let's say some SaaS product company would be a good example, right? Someone selling some sort of SaaS product uh, to the global markets, but they will also have competition. So it's, I haven't met any company, like I think I've invested in over 250 startups. I have not met a single one that didn't have competition, either domestic or global. I get more concerned when they say they don't have competition. So everyone has competition, but modes don't necessarily get built by being, uh, you know, just because I think the definition of what is defensible I, defensible tech is also changing, right? Just because so much of today's world 
in tech is about plug and plays and stitching systems together and creating a solution as compared to just doing deep like r and d there is an element of that too but uh, the world is changing very very dramatically around that that said i at least my view is that uh, modes get built with excellence in what you do and excellence comes with focus so irrespective of whether you're building a b2b business a core ip business uh, or a b2c business which has you know competition i can tell you everything has competition uh, sometimes we just don't know the names but every company has lots of competition that the ceo is uh, you know anxious about and thinking about in the shower how to overcome uh, overcome uh, the same so i i do believe that as our ecosystem is evolving we are seeing uh, that entrepreneurs are maturing they are not going after 10 things or 10 products in the same company they are picking one one big problem statement focusing on that going deep for many quarters or years at times and just becoming really excellent at it and that is what is building modes or will both build modes in our ecosystem and i actually believe that that applies even to b2c businesses that from the outside may seem like oh this is i don't know digital payments or e-commerce or uh, uh, you know mobility all these hyper competitive you know, food delivery all these are incredibly hyper competitive businesses nobody will ever make money in them it may take a while but there will be examples over a period of time that companies that work with focus and discipline will get really excellent at that business and that will be their moat compared to other market players in their industry who seemingly seem like competitors but actually doing five other things also so they are not becoming excellent at any one thing so i i feel as an ecosystem the the, the biggest learning fair enough let me yeah let me let me ask you just one follow up question on that uh, and get your views on so shridhar rembu of zoho right he's he's spoken and written about this he's saying that india and of course he's speaking from a b2b saas standpoint often but i think it applies broadly he says that india has of course built a lot of apps now right that have gained a lot of traction in a lot of users etc but now we need to start going into the deeper layers of the software stack yeah right the middle layer and the foundational layers of the software stack if we want to build those kinds of tech driven modes that i am referring to right so while there is nothing to say that you can't build excellent competitive and of course defensible companies at the top layer at that app layer question is how do we start moving down to the middle and foundational layers of that software stack uh, where fewer companies tend to compete because there you need much more core tech expertise yeah so i i look uh, you agree with yeah i i do agree transition that uh, yeah i do agree with uh, what shridhar says and I myself a pro- proponent of it, and I sort of vote with my uh, capital on it. Uh, uh, but but many founders who are building, you know, core software products that various types of businesses, enterprises, mid-market customers in India or uh, in India or outside India. Uh, but I do, I do feel strongly about dispelling the notion that modes can only be built. Uh, by uh, businesses that are core software businesses, uh, because um, sure. because we don't want a situation where founders in India stop building other important businesses that need to be built also because they somewhere feel that those businesses lack moats because they don't. Um, yeah, business even in a competitive B two C market that is not. Um, you know, seeing the results it's seeing is probably because it's lacking some amount of focus. And the same same dynamic can actually apply to a core software business as well. There there are there are enough examples of software core businesses where people have taken years to build the IP, but they are still unable to have strong moats around their business um, because they probably lack lack the focus needed for excellence. like other pieces I, i i think i absolutely agree with your point there that there are obviously multiple ways to build moats i think the goal should be to build a moat uh and you have multiple options in a way to pick on uh as part of your strategy to build that moat so i know we just have a couple of minutes left kunal and uh, i i would like to end i think with a with a question where maybe you look back into your own experience and share 
uh, a few pieces of advice for now aspiring entrepreneurs who might be listening to us today on what the next decade holds for them and what they can do to prepare like what are those three four five things that they should focus on that might be different from you know when you when you and i might have started uh, what are some three or four things that you would uh, share with those aspiring entrepreneurs today yeah i think um, i would say that we live in the most conducive era for entrepreneurship uh, in india than we ever before so um, you know when i was in college uh, when we were in college i like now many years ago i i entered college a few years after the dot com boom i used to always reminisce about the fact that i wish i was just a few years uh, born a few years earlier and i could have partaken in this real boom of 98 99 obviously there was a bust also but the the creation that happened then we have seen the benefits of that the googles and all those companies great companies of it then and um, at some level i feel so elated that in in some ways god has given me one more chance right to just in a different country this time in my own country to be part of an ecosystem which is at the precipice of greatness right at the precipice of such yeah. massive explosive growth um and 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 so i with a the very supportive government right which is very startup friendly how many times do you hear of a prime minister talk about startups in any other country i think here it's every other week um uh, you know i'm on this national startup i'm on this national startup advisory council uh, chaired by the honorable commerce minister mr piyush goel we meet once a quarter we spend 4 hours discussing all the things that we need to do in the country to uh, enhance entrepreneurship i mean it's incredible uh, the the government support that this ecosystem has like you said we have abundant talent we have incredible opportunities a billion internet users across various segments of the population we have all the in your book you mentioned anurudh all these rails that have gotten created with india stack upi ondc coming up that democratize uh, uh, you know digital payments commerce and other aspects of the digital economy um now you know a few years ago at a similar conference if someone asked let's say 5 6 years ago hey kunal what do you think is the next big wave this is the time when e-commerce was on a high and that was the number one uh, place uh, no, number one conversation starter in any tech conference um uh, at that time people would ask hey what's next what's coming in the next 5 10 years and you almost 90% of the time get the same two answers healthcare and education right every founder even if you asked me 5 6 years ago hey kunal where do you see the next wave coming in india i would also probably say healthcare and education and i'm so happy that everyone was right because we have seen such an incredible explosion in the especially the education the edtech space and to a good degree in the healthcare space now when i'm asked this question i say that look we already have escape momentum escape velocity in healthcare and education tech but in the next 10 years india has this incredible opportunity like healthcare edtech e-commerce digital payments mobility for all domestic opportunities the opportunities now in front of us as a country across web3 Uh, biotech and climate tech particularly are at a global scale we have now have every we have all the ingredients we have global talent global capital domestic capital uh, a hugely interconnected uh, world to leverage uh, these uh, you know incredible opportunities in these three areas uh, web3 biotech and climate tech and i do hope the next 10 years founders in our country um take it upon themselves to make india a global leader in in these three areas yeah no i think uh, kunal uh, very aptly said i think uh, climate and biotech of course web3 a lot of the internet tech entrepreneurs of today are already have their eyes on on the web3 opportunity but i think and i mentioned this pretty much exactly as you said in the book that we must as india have our eye on the next game which to my mind is moving very quickly to the climate and biotech arenas yeah. and i think if we can use exactly as you said those elements that we have in place to build ourselves as the early movers and global potentially global leaders in these spaces i think that's um, potentially a even bigger opportunity than the internet tech opportunity that we've all uh, 
the fortune and privilege of having lived through over the last decade. No, so great. I think this has been a lovely conversation. I know it was a bit short, Kunal, but it was absolutely uh, delightful uh, to be in conversation with you again. And I hope uh, we're able to talk more about the emerging opportunities at a future time. And I hope that everyone who is listening in found this useful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anirudh.